Hello, everybody. We're going to get started in just a couple minutes. I see people uh, entering the webinar now, so we're going to get give people a minute or two to get settled, and we will start promptly uh, right around noon, another minute or two. Uh, if you are having any issues, uh, please use the chat box. Uh, type it in if you're having a problem, and we'll try to address that as we can. So uh, sit tight. We'll be right with you. All right, well, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us. My name is Chris Bonamy. I am the Deputy Director for the DuPage County Stormwater Management Department, and we are here today for a water quality uh, outreach webinar where we will cover tree survival in stormwater projects. Uh, we'll talk about installing, maintaining, and protecting trees within your, your municipality or your project area. We'll discuss steps that you can take to ensure tree survival, including hiring an arborist, selecting correct trees for your project and using proper tree preservation techniques. Uh, this is a free webinar and one PDH, one professional development hour will be available. We have several of these workshops throughout the year. We find that these workshops are a great way to connect like-minded organizations and individuals who are concerned with the water quality in our local lakes, rivers, and streams. Uh, these workshops are uh, part of our public outreach and education programs that help us meet requirements outlined in our ILR 40 permit with the Illinois Environmental Protection Agency. The webinar is being recorded, so if you know of others that couldn't be with us this afternoon, uh, we will provide a link so that you can share that with them uh, if you feel that they would benefit. A uh, couple quick thank yous. Uh, thank you to Mary Mitros. She is our stormwater communication supervisor, and she is running the program today. Uh, thanks to the Conservation Foundation. They are our partners for all of these webinars, uh, specifically Jan Rail. Uh, she is the DuPage County Program Director for the Foundation, and she helped line up our speaker for this afternoon. Uh, and speaking of our speaker, thank you to Alicia Burchaki, Burchaki, sorry. Uh, she's from HLR and she's uh, here to teach us about these trees today. So thank you for being here. And once again, I'd like to thank all of you for joining us this afternoon. Uh, before we begin, I do just want to make a couple quick comments. I want to wish all of our mothers uh, that are with us today a very happy belated Mother's Day. Mothers are very special people and they deserve to be pampered at least once a year. Uh, we tried to do something very nice for my wife last Sunday. There was cooking, cleaning, flowers, presents, back massages, ice cream, cards, candy, and everything was going great until my son uh, cleared the dinner table after dinner, uh, which he normally doesn't do. Uh, and he said, mom, don't worry about these dishes. Uh, you can get them first thing tomorrow morning. Didn't go over so well. Uh, he does pretty well in school, but uh, I think he's still got a lot to learn. And speaking of learning, today we're going to learn about trees and their proper care and preservation. Uh, and this is great for me, I love trees. Trees help clean our air. They filter our water, help reduce flooding, and they provide shade and cool our cities by up to 10 degrees. Uh, the only bad thing about trees are squirrels. And that leads me to my favorite joke about squirrels. Uh, where do squirrels go during hurricanes and tornadoes? 
it depends on which direction the wind is blowing. Eh, not too bad, not too bad. Anyway, how about this one? How long does it take for a crow to eat a dead squirrel on the road? It depends on the traffic. It depends on the traffic. All right, anyway, I am excited to learn about tree preservation, but before we do, I want to remind everybody that you're muted. If you do have comments or questions during the presentation, please type those directly into the chat box and we will relay those on to uh, Alicia uh, at the end of her presentation. Uh, and also another quick reminder, you are responsible for your own video cameras, whether you want those on or off is completely up to you. All right, uh, let me introduce our speaker, and it's Alicia Berchacki. Uh, Alicia is an environmental scientist with HLR Engineering. She's been with HLR Engineering for about 10 years. Uh, she has experience working as an environmental scientist throughout the Chicagoland area. Uh, Alicia is, uh, ha has knowledge in natural area restoration, wetland delineations and permitting, municipal tree consulting, tree and uh, threatened endangered species surveys, environmental assessments, erosion control inspections, and last but not least, geographic information uh, systems mapping, GIS mapping. Uh, so with that, Alicia, thank you uh, for being with us. And uh, Mary, let's turn things over to her so she can begin her presentation. Thanks for the introduction. I'm gonna start sharing my screen now. And then I guess if everything looks okay, I'm going to go ahead and get started. Yeah, it looks great. Looks great. Okay. So as stated, I'm going to talk about seven steps to tree survival for your stormwater projects. Um, we're going to cover uh, if you should hire an arborist, and if so, why? Municipal consulting. Why you should be selective why you should be knowledgeable, follow and use of tree preservation measures to remove or not to remove trees within your project area, and watching out for new and current invaders in our area or soon to be in our area. So the first section I'm going to cover is hiring an arborist. We're going to go over what a certified arborist is who can get the certification, some specialties that you can focus in, why you should hire an arborist for your project and what they can do for you. So what is the certified arborist? Um, it's an individual who's trained in the art and science of planting, caring for it and maintaining trees. Um, there are some stringent requirements you need. So you need three or more years of full-time eligible practical work experience in arboriculture. So when they say that, they really mean working with trees, whether it's removal, tree surveys, work that directly relates to trees. And they also want you to have a degree in the field of either arboriculture, horticulture, landscape ar architecture, or forestry from a regionally accredited educational institution. Uh, environmental science does seem to pass, but I know people who have biology and ecology degrees, and depending on your course load, that may not count. So it's important to really break down what your focus is and see if it'll work. And you must pass an exam. Um, I would say this exam is probably one of the more challenging exams we have to take in our industry. It covers 10 areas of knowledge and you need to pass each section to pass the exam as a whole. Um, the sections it covers are soil management, identification and selection, installation and establishment, safe work practices, tree biology, pruning, diagnosis and treatment, urban forestry, tree protection, and finally tree risk management. Um, if someone you know is looking to become certified, I definitely recommend studying or maybe see if there's a class available. Um, it's a lot of information. And then to keep the certification, you need to either retake the exam every three years or earn a total of 10 continuing education credits per year or 30 within the three years. There are five different areas that you can specialize in and there's an exam for each specialty. Um, those are listed on the left side of the screen. Once you pass the exams and become certified in all the specialties, you can then become a master arborist. 
For that title, you need to pass an extensive scenario based exam and abide by a code of ethics, which ensures your quality of work and that you meet that master arborist title. To give you an idea, fewer than 2% of all ISA certified arborists hold the master certification. It's a lot of work. It's very hard to get. Most of the arborists that I know have the ISA certified arborist and then the municipal consulting specialty. If anybody's interested in getting certified or hiring those with a certification, um, this flowchart I find useful. It shows all the jobs kind of relevant to each section, and then it shows the entry level position for those and how you can kind of move up in that section of the industry. If you go to the ISA website, this is where the chart can be found. It has the title has fact sheets attached and then it'll show you a job description, what kind of background they might have, educational requirements, training needs, eligibility requirements, any other certifications or licenses that you may need in the future. So why hire an arborist? I think that it's important to for people to understand how hard it is to get the certification and that it really is a specialized knowledge and that you need experience to even get the certification. So you, there's a lot of stuff leading up to making sure that you know what you're talking about. Um, when it comes to the manual labor aspects, you know, like the pruning and that kind of stuff, a lot of people could do the work physically, but may not understand the long-term impacts of exactly where they cut the branch, why certain locations and pruning are important. Uh, planting in municipalities and stuff, making sure that like shorter species are planted under power lines, what trees may cause sidewalk impacts, uh, risk management issues of certain species. Some trees have, you know, more sensitive bark or are more likely to have damage. Bartlett pears are one of those. I find that they're very sensitive. Um, an example of how Hiring an arborist has helped, at, you know, in a professional and personal sense. I had a friend who was buying a house. There was a large ash tree in the front yard. They thought it was kind of sick, but they weren't sure. So they asked me to come over and look at it. I looked at the tree. It definitely had the D bore holes for emerald ash borer. It had dying back in the crown. I was able to write a letter that they provided to the seller and they were able to get some money off to help get that tree removed because it was hanging over the roof of the house. Um, so, you know, it can be useful in many aspects of your life and not just a professional one. As a certified arborist, we work on a lot of different products. Um, the top photo is of a landscape design plan that was submitted for Raising Canes in the village of Cullen Ellen, which is where I am a consulting arborist for them. For this project, we work directly with the landscape architect to make sure that the plans follow the village ordinance, the trees selected made sense because the actual landscape architect lives, lived in Louisiana. So she wasn't very familiar with what things were like up here. So it was important that she had that communication with us. Um, and then the bottom two photos are of a native area where they wanted to expand the native buffer and the, to help combat with flooding issues. This was a residential area. The trees around the pond in the picture on the bottom left consisted mostly of mulberry and silver maples. We decided along with the municipality to go ahead and remove those since they were mostly undesirable. And then the second picture is of the removal that we did in the winter. Um, the one tree had a pretty heavy lean, so I think this could have been a safety issue in the future, especially since, like I said, it's residential. They have kids and stuff playing. There's a big grass area adjacent to this. And then before we move on to the next topic, um, the ISA website is always a great resource to use if you're looking for an arborist to use for your projects. And then also treesaregood.com is another website that can be helpful. Next, we're going to talk a little bit about municipal consulting. Uh, I just want to mention that not every municipality can have someone on staff full time to kind of assess with reviewing projects that may have an impact on trees within their city or village. Um, so a lot of times they'll hire an outside consultant such as myself to kind of help with this task. 
Um, so I work with the village of Glen Ellen. Um, they t have requirements for certain projects. So if you're disturbing 300 square feet or more, um, they typically make you submit a tree preservation application. Some exceptions to this are like dust, uh, decks and fences because they have individual posts. So the ground disturbance is much more minimal than if it was like a concrete patio or paper patio. To give you an idea, I typically review over 200 projects each year for them. But the bulk of that being in like right now in spring and early summer, a lot of people trying to get stuff in for, you know, graduation parties and everything. Um, I do coordination with the applicant. I will coordinate with the contractor. I will coordinate with the village, the planning department, if it's like a raising canes or it's a commercial development. Uh, I will help the applicant fill out their form if they need help with anything. I work a lot with the public works department, especially for parkway trees, because they do all the management and maintenance for the parkway trees in the village. There's a lot of coordination that can go on with these products. Uh, in the end, we have final say on if it gets approved or denied. Um, a lot of times I try to work with um, the applicant to kind of work around any issues I foresee and make sure that the project can move forward. For many of the projects, um, we assist with site inspections as well. So let's say the building inspectors typically will go out and look at the tree fencing, the tree protection fencing. If they can't go out, I will go out and look at that for them. Since I have experience with soil erosion control, I will also help with um, their erosion control salt fencing if that's required, if it's like a new single family home. Um, I will also be on site if there's directional drilling along the parkways to make sure the trees are protected. We had a job on the south side of Chicago where they required an arborist to be on site 24 seven because of a historic neighborhood. They wanted to protect the trees. They didn't allow them to open trench anything. They had to drill, they had to look for tree roots. It was a whole thing. So like that's important and then also I like to be on site if they're doing any root pruning on trees where I feel like there's going to be big significant roots within the project area. This is kind of just a quick shot of the cover page of their application. I find that we're pretty strict on what we want included on the application. We want on the tree plan, we want any trees on their lot to be shown. We want anything within 15 feet of the lot line or neighboring lots to be shown, and we want any trees within the public right of way. The public right of way is important because those trees aren't technically theirs, the homeowners. So we want to make sure that me and Public Works are ensuring that those trees are protected. And then the trees within 15 feet are important because, as you know, if you have a big oak tree, the roots or canopy could be hanging over the lot line, and it's important for let's say a detached garage project where they're gonna, you know, need to put in a foundation. It may be a story or two high, so we may need to look at branch impact and if any of that's gonna need to be cut back, I wanna make sure that that's gonna be done properly. So making sure that the project area is shown and all of the trees around is super important. And this is unfortunately where I find people struggle the most. So I will typically, make adjustments on site unless it's something significant where I need to get the applicant involved. And then we actually have fees that we um, make people pay <laughs> for the work being done. So there's a set review fee um, that we charge. You know, it's just for me to go out and look at the project and kind of give feedback. Um, there's a fee for any tree removal they wanna do within the parkway that is also a set fee. And then the new tree fee is another fee that we can charge them. If let's say it's a new single family home and they want, we think that there's room for a new parkway tree, we can then apply that fee. The fertilizer and water is typically included in that new tree fee. And then there's another bond, which is a flexible value. It's held only for parkway trees. Um, the maximum that can be withheld is determined by me based on the product scope. So let's say they have like this example here, they have three trees in their parkway. The value of these trees based off of the villages, uh, 
programs uh, says that they're worth, you know, 3,500. We'll round down a little bit. Um, I'm not going to actually hold that much money. Like, let's say this was a patio project, you know, maybe I'll hold $500 just to make sure that the parkway trees adjacent to the driveway that could be impacted are going to be protected. But I understand that the likelihood of that is pretty minimal. Um, so it's just kind of things to keep in mind of how you can protect your trees and your municipalities and why it's important to maybe have someone looking at these projects, making sure that the proper protocols are being taken. So now we're going to talk a little bit about being selective and kind of how to choose trees for your project area. So I'm kind of just going to cover some things that I think are kind of basic things that should be paid attention to when selecting trees for your project. So we're going to go over a little bit of hardiness zones, the tree size from the nursery, types of trees, whether they have seeds or fruit, and then a little bit about salt tolerance. So as you can see here, Illinois is, is in the middle of this map. This is the USDA plant hardiness zone map. I think a lot of us have seen this, even if it's just for personal projects at our house. Um, Illinois is split into two major zones. The northern half is in zone five and the southern half is in zone six. Some municipalities and counties have limitations on what trees you can select for. Uh, for example, DuPage County requires that everything be in zone five because that's where DuPage County is. Uh, this obviously I think could change as we see climate change kind of advancing and potentially making Illinois a little bit warmer. Uh, for now, I think we're set for a little while, but it's something to just keep in mind going forward with your products. And I know for us personally, we have an office in Springfield and Mount Carmel, which are in the southern half of Illinois. So depending on what project we're working in, it can be a big difference between what trees we're selecting for each area. This photo is actually of a project we did down south. It was a large tree insulation project for an impact that needed to be mitigated for. These trees, you can see are fairly small. Uh, this was fine for the requirements where the project was being installed, but would may not be okay for a project up here. I know DuPage has some requirements with either the caliper or the height. So deciduous trees, they want a minimum of three inches. It can be 2.5 if it's like a single residential development and at least six inches above ground level. Evergreen trees have a minimum height rather than a caliper. Um, so they would like the trees to be eight feet and it can be six feet for a single lot residential project area. So it's just a reminder again to check your local requirements. Everybody may have slightly different uh, things and then make sure that you're coordinating properly with the nursery that you're gonna order your trees from to make sure that they're gonna fit those requirements as well. Also availability, I guess, would be a big factor too. And then another thing would be the soil is also very important. There are a lot of resources out there, such as the Morning Arboretum is a great one where you can select the hardiness zone, the foliage type, light exposure, soil preference, whether you want native or non-native species, um, tolerances such as salt, which we'll talk about in a little bit, your planting site, whether it's a road right of way or a median, stuff like that, you can filter all of these selections in there to make sure that, you know, you're getting trees that only will work for your site. Um, so that's definitely something to look into if you're not as familiar with trees on your own. Another thing to consider when choosing plants for your project area is if they have fruits or nuts. And if so, will that be an issue for your project area, the people living around that, any cars that may be adjacent to the project area? Uh, so these two pictures, the one on the left is of the fruits of a black walnut. The one on the right is of an Osage orange. You can see they both have relatively large fruits that could cause damage or hazards to the surrounding areas. So denting cars, like I said, they could be a tripping hazard. Uh, ginkgo biloba, which was the tree like three slides ago on the intro slide to this section, um, that had fruits on it. That was a female tree. If you've had the unfortunate encounter of a female ginkgo tree while it is fruiting, you will know that they smell horrible. Um, so a lot of municipalities um, and contractors and stuff will try to avoid selecting the female trees and work with the nursery to try to only get males. 
unfortunately, I know that is not always easy to determine. So there are <laughs> municipalities around that unfortunately have female ginkgo trees. Um, but those are the kind of things that you should really be looking for, depending on the scope. You know, if you're doing trees in a parkway for, you know, or a detention basin, like obviously what you need can be very different. And then another thing to look out for is salt tolerance. I think, you know, sometimes maybe that gets a little bit overlooked, um, especially if you're doing anything adjacent to roadways, medians, you know, that kind of stuff. Some species that can be very tolerant to salt, uh, sycamore, maples, horse chestnut, apple serviceberry, honey locust, Kentucky coffee tree. These can be good trees for areas like that. There are various resources available to find out the solid tolerance of trees. Marin Arboretum is another good one. You can also Google most of the time you can just find. Um, but it's something to keep in mind because even with detention basins, you're getting a lot of stormwater runoff, you know, after winter is done and a lot of salt coming in. So you just want to make sure that these are things that you're keeping in mind for the future of your project area, not necessarily the initial install. So be knowledgeable. This is going to be more about planting locations, wet and dry species, groupings or rows, kind of being aware of your surroundings um, and what's in your buffer. So it's very important to know your site, the topography, the soil type, uh, is it within a floodplain? Uh, these are gonna be important when choosing species for and where you're going to plant them in your project area. So if you're gonna be mapped in hydric soils with a floodplain, you're gonna wanna choose wetter species like a pawpaw or a pin oak, sycamore, river birch, all of these trees like moist to wet soil, full to partial shade, um, as far as groupings go, I think groupings tend to look more natural than rows. And I understand that obviously like in our parkways and sometimes medians, rows is really the only option. You can't really group in those. Um, but I, I think groupings are better. The project here was on the south side of Chicago. And these are some oaks that were planted. I mean, kind of tried to do a mix of a little bit of like road groupings, if that makes sense. Um, and it seemed to work for this project area. And then something else is when, you know, making sure you're being aware of your surrounding area. So infrastructure, pipelines, we wanna make sure we're keeping trees away from those as much as possible. You wanna think about the long-term life of the tree, how big it'll get, how do the roots grow? So for example, if a tree is planted too close to infrastructure, you know, is, is common with houses and stuff, You'll have the roof causing or the roots causing structural issues to the foundation or you know to the basement or if it's a pipeline project like i said earlier the tree roots can actually cause holes or bends in the pipelines and can damage the pipeline if this is a company like nightcor that can be you know a big danger which is why a lot of the time you'll see Utility companies, especially guys, gas pipelines, keeping their easements mowed and free from trees. They want to avoid those potential hazards as much as possible. These are some maps um, that we look at a lot of the times for our project area. Um, the one on the left is the FEMA floodplain map, and the one on the right is the soils map. This was for a project that we're doing with York Township in Downers Grove. They're looking to improve some drainage infrastructure stuff. So the flood pay map, you can see a lot of the red boxes in this area are within floodplain. And then on the right, the soils map, typically anything in dark green is considered dry, while everything from light green, orange to red are all likely gonna have some sort of hydric to them. So they're gonna be somewhat wet. You can use the Natural Resource Conservation, so NRCS website, and you can actually select your state and county. And this will give you a list of the hydric soils in your project area. So you could use this web soil survey map, get the code of what the soil type is for your project area, and then look it up on there to make sure that it's hydric in the county that you're gonna be working in. And then this is just a plan drawing of that same kind of project area. So, the issues with having the area was having issues with flooding. There wasn't proper drainage. 
So we're detaining, we are creating a vegetated drainage soil and a detention basin. So it's those two longer strips at the bottom of those maps that I showed you. So the drainage soil is being planted with a mix of sedges and grasses and shrubs and trees. And this is a little bit of a picture of what that design is looking for. We try to make sure that the shrubs and the trees were away from any culverts and drainage areas coming into this project area within the easement to make sure that it was away from any structures adjacent because it's within a residential area. A total of 18 shrubs and four trees are gonna be planted for this project. Um, and we try to make sure to select for a species that would be tolerant to some water since this is gonna have water flowing through it during high water seasons, so spring. So now we're gonna talk about the thing that I think is the most troublesome, following and using tree preservation measures. Uh, I know this is a little bit of a boring slide compared to all the pretty pictures we've seen so far, but I think it's important to, again, know the requirements in your area. This is from the Tupage County Building Code. Uh, it's just a list of protection measures that they recommend that you should be taking with projects that have trees. Um, so just, again, remember to check your state, county, municipal to make sure there, if there's any specific measures you need to be taking in your project area, you're doing so. So a lot of us have probably seen this Illinois Urban Manual specification for how to install tree protection fencing. Um, I find that this is probably what gets not completed thoroughly the most. Most of the time, I'll show you on the next slide kind of like examples of how I see people mostly installing tree fence. I feel like the drip line is a big confusing part. Um, so making sure that the drip line is covered to protect those critical root zones. Uh, we allow in the municipalities and the projects I work in typically a lot of people just use the snow fencing or the plastic mesh fence, either in orange or green. You know, we don't really care as long as the trees are being protected. Um, the right side, I think it's important to note the difference between you know, the size of your tree and where the sidewalk and stuff ends. You can see on the top part, it kind of shows a little bit of protection on the far side of the sidewalk. Um, something to keep in mind just as you're looking at stuff. So this is kind of typical things that I see. Uh, the picture on the left is kind of what not to do. As you can see, they kept the fencing very close to the trunk of the tree. They're not protecting the critical root zone at all. It may be hard to tell, but they're going to be putting a driveway in um, closer to us. And what I had them do to change this was I basically had them put the fencing up to the sidewalk, up to the street, uh, as wide as the branches were going on the far side, and then close to where the driveway is going to be, just basically as far as they could to make sure that driveway was or make sure that roots that we could protect, you know, in that driveway footprint could be protected. And then the picture on the right is kind of what I hope people do. So I wanna see it go all the way out to the sidewalk, all the way out to the street, and you know, really protect as much as you can of that critical root zone. This is also important. Um, it's kind of an example of how to protect the soil and the roots. Uh, if you're not gonna be excavating near and you just need to like transport equipment over the roots, a lot of times we'll just have people put plywood down. Um, you don't have to do something as elaborate as in this top picture. Plywood typically does the job. Um, it kind of spreads out the distribution of weight of the equipment and kind of helps limit the impact, um, the soil compaction, which allow roots to get the air and water that they need. Uh, there are a lot of Resources if you have to impact a tree, but avoidance is best. I think that's always important to remember unless you have to, please avoid it. Um, the bottom is just some basic mulching. I feel like sometimes we need that reminder of mounded mulch is not best. It can actually create like suffocation for the tree. So make sure you're leaving that little divot where water and stuff can kind of rest and sit. And then something important to note is that Roots are typically found within the upper 18 inches to 24 inches of the soil. So they're not as deep as I think sometimes we think they are. 
And then keep in mind the structure of the tree. So like evergreens tend to have like one deep tap root and then a bunch of surface roots around where deciduous trees tend to kind of spread all the way around and don't have that tap root that we kind of think of. And again, Illinois Urban Manual is another great resource, you know, to get some of this stuff. Trunk protective cloth. Um, so if you have to work, you know, close to a tree and you need to protect it, this is another thing where you can like at least protect the trunk from getting scraped from a larger equipment because unfortunately that is something that we'll see sometimes at a project where a utility line was, you know, upgrading a service and they totally scraped the bark off of a tree. Luckily the tree is fine, but it does happen. Um, so the tree cloth should be no longer than the boards and it should come out over the top and the bottom to provide, you know, to limit rubbing of those boards on the trunk. So that cloth underneath is very important. Um, and as we've mentioned before, augering under is definitely a best practice. If you can avoid open trenching and auger underneath, that is the best way to go. Um, and that's shown in the right. You can see how going a certain depth is allowing them to avoid the roots altogether. So when I'm looking at a project, um, you know, you kind of want to look all around at your surroundings. Um, so damage to the trunk, damage to the branches, mounting of soil, which I talked about a little bit. Um, just like with the mulch, um, I've seen contractors, you know, pile soil if they didn't have proper tree fence up around the roots. You know, again, this is creating a whole zone where air and water is potentially not getting to the roots in that section. So you really want to make sure that all the work is being done outside of that critical root zone. Uh, improper pruning is something you kind of want to look for. Luckily, a lot of municipalities don't allow homeowners to do that work themselves um, and changes in topography. So the top picture is kind of showing branches that got hit. So that red circle is highlighting branches that I think would have easily gone unnoticed. Um, my guess is the bobcat or something had uh, the front bucket up too high. I'm not really sure what happened. This was a new residential home development. Uh, so if I had not mentioned anything and left this basically open wound, it leaves the tree vulnerable to pests or infections because it doesn't allow that branch to then heal over properly. So what I did was I contacted Public Works since I knew they did all the work on the parkway trees. They came out clean cut the branch, they pruned it properly to cut it back um, and all is good. And then the bottom photo is of tree roots that were improperly root pruned for driveway. So it looks like basically the equipment that did the excavation, they just put it in there, scraped away and kind of tore and exposed the roots. Um, this is never ideal to use equipment to tear roots like this. I always suggest proper root pruning, either with loppers or a saw. A clean cut is going to allow that root to heal properly, and it's going to reduce stress on the tree in the long run. Even with that driveway being that close to the root system, that's fine. You know, as long as you're limiting the impact to the roots, you know, to 40% or less, you know, you, you can do some impacts. Another issue we see, which I talked about, was the soil mounding near the base. It can reduce oxygen and water, so that's important to make sure you're keeping a lookout for that in construction areas. Um, this issue, like I said, is, can be applicable with topography as well. In a project where the design called for changes in the topography in the backyard for a garage, uh, the change would have killed the trees in the backyard. Uh, which is one of the reasons the homeowner, a homeowner bought that house in the first place. They liked the trees in the yard. Uh, I was able to work with the applicant and the stormwater engineer to come up with a solution using retaining walls that allowed them, you know, to get the topo they needed for that project. Uh, I talked a little bit about this. Root pruning is probably one of the things we do get asked about the most. Uh, cutting when a tree is dormant and not actively growing is best. So winter. Also avoid cutting in environmentally stressful conditions such as droughts or floods. Clean cuts allow for the wound to close, making the tree less susceptible to pathogens and drying out. Cutting one side of the tree at a time is crucial. Um, 
So let's say you need to put in two impervious areas next to a tree, I would recommend that you stagger those installs. So maybe you do one section one year and then another section the next year or even two years um, to kind of give it time to heal because if you lose 40% of the you know critical roots that could basically cause the tree to die. So you need to kind of stagger some of that work if you need to really put that in or change the scope of your project. Uh, a general guideline is that critical root zone is 1.5 times the DBH. Um, so if your DBH is six inches times 1.5, you'll wanna stay at least nine feet away from the base of your tree. I find that using the drip line is a much easier approach for a lot of the contractors rather than using the math the time that I really only use the math is if there's a driveway or something, a sidewalk, you know, some sort of infrastructure that needs to be put in place where you need to try to get as close as you can that may be within the drip line. And then try to auger as much as possible. Um, directional boring is highly, you know, utilized and we're thankful for that with the work that we do with like NICOR and North Shore Gas. Um, it really helps avoid any potential impacts as you can see in that top photo. And then another thing is like certain species are more tolerant. Um, so larger roots are gonna be a bigger issue. So we wanna try to avoid cutting anything over three inches DBH. Cutting one major root can cause the loss of five to 20% of a tree's root system. Um, species, not all of them are the same as you can see in this little chart. Silver maple and red maple are pretty tolerant to soil compaction and root severs, while black and white oaks are super sensitive to both of those things. Um, so it's important to know the tolerance. This is something that you can easily look up. <laughs> ring porous and diffuse porous. So ring porous such as elm, ash, oak, chestnut, and black locust will show stress on the same side that it's cut. Diffuse porous trees such as birch, maple, cherry, poplar, beech, sycamore, honey locust will show stress throughout the entire tree. So that's something you can use if you are in suspicion that your tree may be showing signs of stress from work that's been done. You can look at that and make sure. And then the last thing to keep in mind is impermeable surface adjacent to the trees, like we've talked about before. Uh, it just limits root spreading. So we're going to talk a little bit about to remove or not to remove. Uh, the goal should be to always try and remove as few of the existing trees on site as possible. Or for some projects, removal is necessary. Common reasons for removal, structure installation, regrading potential damage to new infrastructure power lines, invasive, non-desirable species, sick tree, maybe it's a poor quality. Um, it's important to look up requirements in your area. Some may require a permit or mitigation if trees are removed. Um, some municipalities have a monetary fee for trees removed. Uh, for example, let's say $500 per tree removed. Um, I read an article where Wilmette just passed a tree removal fee in lieu of replacement at $125 per inch and is trying to limit the removal of what they're considering heritage trees, which is oak and hickories that are DBH 10 inches DBH or greater and all trees 20 inch DBH or greater. So only the removal will only be allowed if approved by the village forester or preservation officer determines that it would not survive construction. So this is actually also from the DuPage County Building Code. This is a list of prohibited plants. I feel like with Purple Leaf Strife and some of the Forbes and stuff that we've seen becoming a nuisance, it's fairly common, um, but I don't think it's as common to see trees and shrubs on a prohibited list. So I think it's important to keep in mind for your products, maybe avoid selecting these because I think in the future, you know, we're gonna, see more of this and more trees. I think stuff like buckthorn, a lot of us already know um, is an issue, but you know, sycamore has aggressive roots. It crowds out native understory plants, heavy litter with oversized leaves, fruits and twigs. Um, so that's something that you may 
you know, have been interested in planted and not thought about being an issue. So just keep an eye out for, you know, local ordinances and rules. So new and current invaders, I think some of us are gonna know some of these. Um, and as we know, best defense is a good offense. So we wanna make sure that we're kind of aware of what could be coming. And, you know, we're gonna either planting cultivars or things that may have a natural defense or unfortunately using chemicals, biological, cultural controls to kind of help mitigate some of these. Um, so the hemlock, woolly, alligator, uh, these tiny insects secrete a white wax, which you can see on that left photo um, on sap from hemlock shoots and branches. It's uh, on the watch list for the state of Michigan. Uh, it kills the needle shoots and branches of the hemlocks. Uh, it slows the growth of the trees and they become less vigorous and may take off take on a grayish and green appearance. Um, they typically infest large and older trees and they are often killed from stress. Um, drought can obviously exaggerate this. It was accidentally introduced in North America from Japan. It was first found in Eastern United States near Richmond, Virginia in 1951. And uh, the pest now is from Georgia to Maine and Southwest to Nova Scotia. As of 2015, 90% of the geographic range of the Eastern hemlock in North America has been affected by this. Um, so really what you're looking for is that white waxy material at the base of the needles on your hemlocks. And this is kind of just a map showing some of the spread of this guy. And then unfortunately, there's another one, the balsam woolly aglid. It's a sap feeding insect that attracts two true fir trees, including balsam fir and Fraser fir. It's on the watch list for the state of Michigan as well. It could be introduced to the state in a number of ways, including nursery stocks, firewood, logs, you know, vehicles. Once here, wind, birds, and animals can carry the insect for miles. Um, it weakens trees, causes twig grouting, and kills the branches, and over the course of several years, causing the trees to die. It was introduced to southeastern Canada from Europe. Um, it's already in the Pacific Northwest and a little bit on the northern east coast. Um, in Great Smoky Mountains National Park, for example, 95% of Fraser firs have been killed by this. Um, so again, you're gonna look for that white waxy material and twigs and branches. So here's kind of like a map of their current spread. That was in Canker's disease, involves an insect native to the Southwestern United States, a newly identified pathogen. It's a relatively new concern for black walnut trees. When tiny walnut twig beetles feed on the tree branches, they introduce a fungal pathogen that causes this. It kills a small area of tissue resulting in cankers. As more of cankers form, branches die, and over time, the entire tree succumbs. It's on Michigan's invasive species watch list. The beetle and fungus can be transported to new areas in walnut logs, firewood, um, and woodworking. What to look for if black walnut trees have wilting leaves or dying branches during summer, check the tree carefully for these little cankers that you can see. And this is kind of a map as of 2017. I couldn't find a more updated one, but something to keep in mind, it's very close to home. Spotted lanternfly, although really pretty, really damaging. Um, it's an invasive plant hopper that causes damage directly by sucking sap from the host plants and indirectly due to mold that grows on the honeydew excretions that inhibit the plant growth and can cause death. It's indigenous to China and India. It was first recorded in the United States in 2014. Uh, it likes maples, birches, walnuts, magnolia, tulip tree, black locust. Um, so definitely something to keep a lookout for. At least this guy should be pretty easy to spot. You can see here's a map. Uh, it's has not been as of 2017. It's not been found in a few counties in Illinois. You can see it in Pennsylvania. Um, the Cerex wood wasp native to Europe, Asia, and North Africa. Sightings have been noted in Indiana and most notably in New York. The most common method for introduction on solid wood packaging material, as well as untreated dried logs and saw timber. 
It attacks a wide variety of pines. The female drills into the wood and inserts a toxic mucus and a fungus along with her eggs. Uh, the mucus prevents antifungal toxins from being formed at the site of infection. The fungus grows on the wood, causing it to dry out and the tree dies within a few weeks or months. So this is kind of a map you can see, there's spots of Michigan. So it's definitely close. Pine shoot beetle, it's native to Europe. It attacks new shoots of pine trees, stunting the growth of the trees. Illinois is currently on the list of quarantine states. The pine shoot beetle may also be attack stressed pine trees by breeding under the bark at the base of the trees. The beetles can cause severe decline in health and the trees, and in some cases kill the trees when high populations exist. Its primary host is the Scots pine, um, but it has also been found in jack pine, red pine, eastern white pine. Uh, you'll notice it flying around in spring, has competitive advantage over other native species of pine bark beetles. What to look for is openings to the egg laying tunnels that can be identified, which we can see on that top right photo. And then here's a little map showing what year, you know, certain counties were quarantined for this. White pine blister rust. It's a species of fungus that causes a disease in white pines. It's native to China. The first signs of this are yellow red spots on the pine needles. You can kind of see that in the bottom left photo. Cankers on the branches, which are visible after two years, which you can see in the top two photos. Um, additional symptoms include branch swelling, branch flagging, orange blisters, and resin flow. All North American white pines are susceptible. Low levels of resistance and high mortality rates. Here's a map from 2019. Okay, so we're gonna talk a little bit about some invaders that we're probably familiar with. I'll go through these quickly. I know we're getting short on time. Um, so Asian longhorn beetles, native to China, Korea, and Japan. It attacks maples, primarily silver maple and box elder. Um, larvae feed in the cambium layer of the tree and later in the heartwood. They dig chambers inside the tree. Several generations can develop within an individual tree, eventually killing it. Adults emerge via large round exit holes. The eradication of this pest was announced in 2008. This insect does occur in other states and could return to Illinois in the future, so it's important to keep a lookout. Box elder nymphs, which I think we have all seen. I know I've had them in my house. Um, they prefer box elder trees as hosts, um, remove plant fluid from newly developing leaves, resulting in distortion of the foliage. Severely infested foliage may appear chloric, so yellow, as in limiting chlorophyll, so less green. In addition to foliar feeding, box elder bugs may also damage the flowers, tender twigs, and seeds of the box elder. Populations of pests have been reported to prefer development on the female trees. Emerald ash borer, uh, in that bottom middle picture, you can see the classic D exit hole that we all know about. This is from Northeast Asia. Um, it was likely introduced in the 1990s and now found in 14 other states and two Canadian provinces. The infested range is expanding rapidly. Um, I think we're all fairly familiar, you know, some municipalities that didn't have a lot of variation in the tree planting lost, you know, all of their parkway trees in large numbers. Um, all 16 native ash trees are susceptible. I feel like green ash seems to be the most um, affected. Uh, so I know people who are doing chemical treatments to their trees and it seems to be helping. So hiring a company that can do that for you could be helpful. Gypsy moss, uh, European native, accidentally introduced to New England in the late 1800s uh, in an attempt to rear an alternative to silk producing insect. Um, in some areas, it has changed the ecology of native forests, defoliating 13 million acres of woodlands in one season. In recent years, the gypsy moth invasion has slowly moved westward with established populations in Michigan, Wisconsin, Indiana, and Illinois. It's a general feeder devouring more than 450 species of plants, so this definitely can be a problem. 
the Japanese beetle, which I think a lot of us are familiar with. 300, they feed on over 300 species of ornamental plants. I'm not gonna get too much into this. Fun side note though, I actually worked for an entomologist at the Martin Arboretum in college for two summers. We did a leaf preference study. So we basically put them in containers with tree leaves and we would determine their preference based on what they ate and if they laid eggs in the container with that tree. It was a very interesting two summers. And then quickly, we'll just go over some diseases that are active. Uh, Anthrocy is a foliar disease caused by several species of fungi to inspect, infect newly emerging leaves. Unfortunately, trees most likely to be affected are quite common, such as ash, dogwood, elm, hickory, maple, and oak and walnut. Uh, most common symptom is the tender brown black blotched areas that you can see in the top left photo. It's a more serious infection on plants whose twigs and buds are susceptible, such as the sycamore and flowering dogwood. Dutch elm disease, I feel like we don't hear about that too much now, but just something to remember and keep in mind, the beetles lay their eggs in infected trees. When the adult beetles emerge, they carry a fungus with them, which when they travel to healthy trees, feed on twigs and upper branches, the disease is most easily detected during the early summer when leaves on the upper branch curl and turn gray. Uh, fire blight is called by a caused by a bacteria. It only affects members of the rose family, um, as, which includes 75 different kinds of trees and shrubs. Uh, the condition is called blossom blight. New leaf growth can be affected. The leaves suddenly will turn black or brown, giving the plant the appearance of having been scorched by fire. Oak wilt is caused by a fungus. It has become a serious disease threat to oaks in Eastern and Central United States. It can be found in all counties in Illinois. All oaks are susceptible. However, red oak subgenuses such as red, black, hills, pin, and scarlet are more susceptible to oak wilt than white oak. Fir oak, English, swamp white, and chinkapin. Uh, Rectilium wilt is caused by a soil fungus. This fungus lives in the soil, small drug and structures. Uh, the fungus spreads into the branches through the plant's vascular, vascular system and simultaneously causes the plant cells to plug themselves. Once the xylem is infected, it becomes so plugged that water can no longer reach the leaves. There seem to be two forms of the disease, disease, one which plants die slowly over several years and another where they die rapidly within a few weeks. Commonly infected plants include maples, catalpa, and magnolia. One or more branches usually on one side of the tree will wilt suddenly. As you can see in that photo on the right hand side, it almost looks like there's a patch just on one side of that tree. Okay, I made it just under one, but if you need anything or have any questions, my email, our website, our phone number are on this slide. Here's a pretty picture of blooming Virginia bluebells. Thank you so much. All right, Alicia, thank you very much. Very good. A lot of great information in there. Uh, we uh, just have a couple minutes left and there are some questions that came in. So I wanna get those to you real quick. Yeah. Uh, Angela was asking, is there uh, the removal fee based, uh, is the removal fee based on the DBH uh, or also species as well as size? So the removal fee that at least Glen Ellen charges is only based on, basically it's a set fee, right? So it's, it's not the DBH and I can go back to the slide because I'm sure you're curious about the Wilmet stuff. Um, so for Glen Ellen, a removal fee is only for parkway trees, and it's like $500 just to cover them being able to plant a new tree in a different part of the city. Um, but as far as private removal goes with Glen Ellen, they don't have any fees currently set in place for those removals. And let me go back to the notes real quick about the Wilmet slide. Sorry, I'm probably going too far. Um, do you often recommend planting willow trees in areas with drainage or flooding issues? No, I, 
Claire, I don't really like willow trees, so I often will not suggest planting them if I'm being totally honest. Um, Here's another question from Logan. Yeah. Do you ever recommend planting a smaller DBH tree for certain species? I've noticed that the uh, with burr oak, for example, that a smaller DBH transplants well, but the two and a half to three inch tree has a lower success rate. I would say it depends on your site and the county slash municipality. I would say if there's no regulations there and you want to go with a smaller caliber, I think that's fine. I, the bigger size, I would just say, you know, it's mostly just dependent on if there's a requirement um, in the area you're working at. I don't, for me personally, I don't have a specific size, you know, big enough that it's going to transplant well and you can keep an eye and has some leaves so you can tell if it's getting stressed and stuff, I would say. All right, very good. Uh, here's one from Mary Beth. Uh, what should we do if we see a new invader or a suspected tree has been affected by one? Um, I'm going to close the PowerPoint real quick. Um, I would say contacting a place like the Martin Arboretum. I think they have good resources um, and people that would know who to contact. I think your local forest service. Um, county foresters, I think anyone that you feel like would be able to give you a second opinion to ensure that what you think you might have is actually what you're finding on your site. All right, very good. And, and one last one from uh, Joel. It's, he says, uh, can uh, Glen Ellen residents prepare the required tree survey or do they have to hire an arborist? You do not have to hire an arborist. So what I do is I tell homeowners, like, even if you have uh, just a basic survey of your yard, or I've honestly had people draw online sheets of paper, and they will just take the sheet of paper, kind of estimate their lot line, um, show their house estimate, driveway estimate, and then put trees on there. And that's good enough as long as I get a rough idea. So no, you do not have to hire an arborist. And if you want, um, me or somebody else can always come out and help you, you know, ID your trees, help you plot them on the thing. We like to keep projects moving along. So I don't like, want to hold anything up if we don't have to. All right, very good. Um, and then there was one final question about uh, one of the uh, slides. Uh, and, and just to let everyone know that we will be sending out uh, uh, the, the PowerPoint presentation, as well as a recording of the meeting. So they should be able to see all of those, uh, the, the slides and the maps and the, and the figures that you provided. So, you know, I, I think that's all we have time for. Uh, Alicia, thank you very much for being with us today and sharing your, your experience and knowledge with us. It was very, very informative and helpful. Uh, I'd also like to thank all of our guests for joining us this afternoon. We hope you have learned and enjoyed uh, the webinar this afternoon. Uh, please remember, as I said, uh, Mary will be emailing everyone with a link to the presentation, uh, a recording of the webinar, and of course, that all very important PDH certificate. Our, our next webinar is scheduled for June 9th, uh, and we will get you more information about that webinar in the very near future. So that's it. Thank you very much, and everyone have a great day. Thank you.